Well, the day of Pentecost, when he, he announced the unlocking of the kingdom of God because of the death of Christ, and thousands came to salvation that day. But these kingdom kings were not limited to, to that type of people. Just later, they go to the house of a Gentile, and he tries this key, and it unlocked the Gentiles. Kingdom keys. Cornelius, you know the story. Do you understand the authority of the one who opens doors no one can shut? Right, of course, right after I said, I'll never preach the book of Revelations, they say, hey, would you come over and preach on Revelations 8? Uh, I suppose. So, so I, I, it was really cool how, how you, you, you get into this and, and you read a scripture as a pastor, maybe as a, just a believer it should be this way. You read this, this scripture and all of a sudden it just comes to life. And it starts to just flow. Uh, it's such a great thing when you know that you are where God wants you to be in his word. So I think today I really have a relevant message from God for not just our church, but for the church. So as we get into the book of Revelations, we are introduced to seven different churches. And each church is very unique in their convictions, very unique in their abilities. Each one has characteristics that are addressed in this letter from the Lord Jesus to each church. So I'm reading through uh, all of the letters to the different churches, though I'm preaching on the church of Philadelphia. I wanted to get the whole scope of what was happening so I started to make notes uh, of these different churches, like good characteristics, bad characteristics. If I was church shopping, which one of these churches would I be, be looking into because of what Jesus wrote to them? And, and so I started my list with words like hardworking, perseverance, remaining true and faithful, great love, faith, service, reputation of being alive, and even wealthy. Now, many of these characteristics we would find attractive in a church that, that we were looking for. But of the seven churches in the scripture, only two of them are mentioned in a totally uh, positive way. But here's some characteristics mentioned of those two. Affliction. Poverty, slandered, suffering, tested, persecuted, endure patiently, and death. Let's go, let's go to the church that people are dying at. Let's go to the church where the people are afflicted and slandered. That's where I want my kids to be taught. We don't. We, we, this is not attractive to us. So the sad thing is the characteristics given that would attract us to a church would have brought us to one in need of repentance. Now it's not that the church in Smyrna or in Philadelphia was perfect, but they were true. They were the true church. So today I want to pose this question to us. Are we the true church? There are more churches in the world today than at any other time in history. Even around Continental, I counted incorrectly because I just thought of another one. So nine churches within 10 minutes of each other. Is that too many? I, I don't know. Churches are everywhere. Not only are they in the community, they're on TV, they're on the radio, they're on social media, they're in magazines, they're in pamphlets, churches are everywhere, but there's more evil now more than ever. How can it be? How can it be? So many churches, so many Christians, so much evil. We say, well, it's our politics. It's those liberals, right? Right? It's those conservatives. That's why we're a mess. No. Well, it's what they're indoctrinating our kids with in the schools. No. It's that baby boomers that raised these kids, right? 
No, no, no. It's, it's these young, new parents. That's the problem with this world. I even hear people say, oh, it's the end times. This is the, and I agree, I think we're getting to the end times. But the end times isn't what the problem is. Do you know what the problem is? The church. The church is the problem. Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There is no exception to that. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church, he says. So why do the gates of hell seem to be prevailing against the church? Because it's not his church. That's the problem. Something's wrong with the church. So I notice nowadays uh, so many people have become about the church. Uh, when really the church needs to be about the kingdom. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. There can be churches with such great qualities, but she's rendered ineffective when she loses her sight of the kingdom. So what I think is we wouldn't have the problems in the world we have today if we weren't having those same problems in the church. Why is homosexuality a problem? Because it's a problem in the church. Why is greed a problem? Because it's a pro See what I'm saying? Because it's a problem within the church. So we find ourselves as congregations or as believers or as denominations taking sides. And the church is actually called to not take sides but to take over. The church is called to take over. Why is the world a mess? Because the church doesn't take over. Read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all about conquering land. You know what the New Testament is about? Conquering land. Conquering hearts. Conquering lives. It's the church's turn to not take sides, but to take over. Ephesians 3.10 says this. His intent was that now, through the church... Everybody say that once. Through the church. Say it with like a little more enthusiasm. Through the church. All right, I'm going to read it. When we get to that part, we just say it with me. His intent was that now... The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished, accomplished, past tense, in Christ Jesus our Lord. God designed to use the church, but many are not who they were intended to be. We have so many churches like that of Ephesus who work hard and have perseverance but have forsaken the love they first had. We have churches like Pergamum remaining true to Christ's name but have strayed from true teaching. We see churches like Thyatira who had great love and faith but tolerate false preachers and teachers. Even more, churches like that of Sardis who look alive but are spiritually dead. Maybe more than anything, we see the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Those churches consumed by wow factors, so much so that they can't see their own pitiful, poor, blind, and naked self. But I'm drawn to that last word of Ephesians 3.10. It said accomplished. That was already accomplished, already done. It's divine authority of God. It's accomplished when you do it. But just for a moment, I want to kind of get sucked into this letter to the church in Philadelphia. It was a little tired church with kingdom keys. The odds were totally against this church. There was little that would attract people to it. It was beat up and it was worn down. But the eyes of the Lord were set on this little church. 
He says these words in the letter, and they're the same words that that he addressed all of the other churches with. He says, I know your deeds. Oh, would that intimidate you or would that encourage you? To five of the seven churches, this sent chills down their spine. But to the true church, it brought a comfort and it brought a peace. Because it's firsthand information. Jesus said to the church, I know your deeds. He knows because he sees. He didn't hear that the church was doing well. And I think some churches need to hear that today. Some Christians need to hear that today. Poor, tired, little church, the Lord sees your faithfulness. Because of two things. Two things are mentioned of the church in Philadelphia. They had kept the word and not denied the faith. Something certain we see all throughout scripture is a faithful church is a useful church. More than any skill set or talent, faithfulness attracts the hand of God upon the life of his church. But boy, have churches strayed from the word. They've traded the pulpit for a coffee table. They've traded sermons for lectures and preachers for hype men, the word of God for sugar-coated, ear-tickling sermons or um, TED Talks or whatever from Satan himself, and it starves the church of her very lifeblood, the word. Church, if we do one thing, we must keep the word of God at the forefront of absolutely everything. So I got to thinking about this church that kept the word. In order for the church to have kept the word, they had to have heard the word. They had to have received the word. They had to have kept the word. But not just that, they had to have loved the word. So I'm thinking of this church in Philadelphia. Was it a group of people that were just gathered together that all of a sudden got the word? I, I don't think it was that way. I think it was a people who pursued the word. It was the people who put themselves in the position to hear the word because they loved the word. How much do you love the word today? How much do you uh, put yourself in the position to hear the word of God? There wasn't any compromise with the world because this church loved the word. There wasn't going to be any compromise because they loved the word. And because they loved the word, they obeyed the word. One thing is for sure. Because of their love, there was no way they would deny. No way. Because when you know the word, receive the word, hear the word, keep the word, you will not turn from the word. Now I get a little excited about this next part. And I know what you're thinking. I thought you were already excited. That was the unexcited me. Mike cleared the stage for me, just in case. The open doors. Just pay attention. Pay attention to the open and closed doors. It says, what he opens, no one can shut. Does it not say that in your Bible? What he opens, no one can shut. Oh, you're pathetic. You're pathetic. In what he shuts, no one can open. All right, thank you. Hey, listen to this. This is what I expected. So in my notes it says, there's an amen that belongs right there. (laughs) Right, Elizabeth? That's what my notes say. Now there's different opinions on this verse, okay? So some people say that this part of the verse is speaking of the door of the kingdom. 
which I would agree with. And some people say that it is a door of opportunity. And so you know how the churches do. We decide to take this side or to take this side and we will split and make a new denomination because we don't know if it's talking about the kingdom or an opportunity. Well, I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to take over. (laughs) So I'm going to tell you how it is. It's obviously both because the door of the kingdom is the door of opportunity. It's that simple. It's that simple. See, we didn't take sides. We took over. There's no doubt gospel overtones in this letter to the church. How do we know that? Because Jesus wrote it. Duh. (laughs) Because Jesus wrote it. And because a church that keeps the word will preach the word. So this this open door to this church is not simply an escape from their difficulties. It is an opening for the preaching of the gospel. It's beautiful. So this divine grace that kept them faithful during persecution was about to make them fruitful. Hmm, A persecuted church is a fruitful church. Amen. I need like an amen button up here. Can we get one installed? Just, I feel like I could really get fired up if I had an amen button. Just can't count on you guys in that. Come on. I lost my spot now. Time out. Can you take time outs when you preach? I'm taking one. Ah, let me see. I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. This is the divine authority of Jesus Christ speaking to the church that kept the word and did not deny his name. So so what he's saying, let me just put this in in terms that maybe would help you understand. He said, I didn't just put a door stop in this door. I ripped the door off the hinges. There is no opposition that can hinder you getting through this door. That's what he's saying. There is no opposition that that has the power to close this open door. None. There we go. Thank you. All right, gotcha. Thanks, Kevin. But not only that, it's not just an open door for this church to run through. It's an open door saying, I have given you the power to bring others through the door. To bring others through the door. It is a full access to the kingdom because it's already been accomplished through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3. He has the final say, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. If we keep the word, love the word, Preach the word. The enemy cannot shut the door. The unbeliever cannot shut the door because Christ has the final say. Example, Jonah. Go and preach to Nineveh. Now, Lord, I think I'll just close that door. Right. Jonah, you can't shut that door. Think of your own testimony. How many times did you try to shut the door on the gospel, but praise the Lord that you didn't have the authority to shut it? So think of the times we preach the gospel in the street or in the workplace or at the school, and we're laughed at, and they deny his name. They don't want anything to do with it. They don't have the power to shut that door. They may think they did, but God swings the doors in this realm. Keep preaching the gospel. So this little church may have been small in number, but they had a spiritual strength that is almost unseen today. They had power made perfect in weakness. They had been faithful with the little things. Maybe what churches are going through today is to see if they'll be found faithful. What if the whole coronavirus is a test of the faithfulness of the church? Whew. 
hang on, church. There's an open door. There's an open door coming. But how can we be sure of success? How can we be sure that this is going to be successful? There's a general rule when it comes to the kingdom of God. The man that keeps God's word has an open door in front of him. Read your Bible. And the man of God will charge through the door. Every time. Because there's a crown and because there's victory. Because it's been accomplished. Ephesians 3. But why don't things seem to be working out, right? We seem to be in this room full of doors and they're all locked shut. I recently started as a maintenance man at a local credit union. Uh, I'm not an office guy. Imagine this at a desk all day. It can't happen. It's impossible. So I have to get out and I have to do things with my hands. Uh, So I do things like change lights and fix plumbing and whatever else I'm told to do. Uh, In my very first day, there was like 15 lights that needed fixed. That's a lot of lights, by the way. And so I get to this one light, and I needed a really tall ladder. So I go back to the maintenance room. I get the really tall ladder. And uh, just, just a side note, there are way too many doors in this place to gracefully glide through with a tall ladder. So I'll be touching up paint also as... Part of my maintenance. Um, so I get to this hallway, and there's, there's a, the little hotel things where you like scan keys to get through. And so I'm, I get to this hallway, and I come to this door, and I stare at the little, I don't know what they're called. What are those called? Huh? Card reader. Card reader. Yeah. I was thinking of something way more sophisticated, but yeah. <laughs> Card reader. So I get to this card reader, and I've got this big ladder, and I'm in this hallway, and I go, I'm stuck. I don't, I don't, somebody's going to have to let me in. This is, this is a great first day. The CEO is going to come in and find the maintenance man stuck in the hallway with a ladder because he locked himself in the hallway. (laughs) Guys, I walked through that door like 10 times that day because I had a key around my neck. I forgot I had a key around my neck. <laughs> but aren't we the same way? We, 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 we run into all these situations in life and, and out into the world and we forget that we have kingdom keys. Amen. We forget. We're, we're just stupidly paralyzed at the door with our life. We're ready to do the work, but man, somebody's got to unlock the door. Luckily, I figured it out before anyone else arrived. (laughs) Had the key, forgot to use it. Matthew 16, just after Jesus tells the disciples that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you know what I got out of that? Hell has gates. Gates have locks. We have keys. Hey, I didn't even hit the button. Kingdom keys. Example, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when he he announced the unlocking of the kingdom of God because of the death of Christ, and thousands came to salvation that day. But these kingdom keys were not limited to, to that type of people. Just later, they go to the house of a Gentile, and he tries this key, and it unlocked the... Gentiles, kingdom keys, Cornelius, you know the story. Do you understand the authority of the one who opens doors no one can shut? The door to the Gentiles still hasn't been closed and it won't be closed. Praise God. Growing up, my dad had a lot of keys. Remember those? Still got them. Of course he does. When something happens to my parents, I'm going to need help cleaning up their 
basement and attic and things. Now, my dad had this set of keys, this big wad of keys, and we called them the church keys. There's not even that many doors in the church as there was keys. I'm pretty sure my dad had no idea what every key on that key ring was. But he kept them, and I didn't know he still kept them. That's terrible. (laughs) He kept them just in case he found a lock that he couldn't unlock. (laughs) Didn't you? Oh, he's got a story next week. So next week... (laughs) Come for the rest of the story. So these were heavy keys. They, were bulk- they filled the entire cup holder in his car. That's, that's how big they were. Big, bulky keys, most of them pointless. Most of them. And I remember multiple times coming to the church as a kid and grabbing Dad's wad of keys to get into the church. Fifteen minutes later. More. Fumbling through the keys. And I I got to thinking one day. I only ever use one key off that whole key set. One key. There's only one key that unlocks the church. I should memorize that key. Well, good thing. I have my own church keys now. (laughs) And I can spot that church key from anywhere. And I got to thinking, aren't we that way? We're fumbling around. With gates and locks, with the wrong keys. We're trying to use the world keys when we have kingdom keys. And maybe another thing, we should stop prying at doors that God has shut. No man can open them, not even you. But that's a whole other sermon. So I think it's time that we throw away the worthless keys that tie us up and weigh us down. The church of Philadelphia had kingdom keys in their littleness and in their weakness. Yet they carried the approval of the one with divine authority to open and to close permanently. There is much to be said of little tired churches. She's tired, but she clings tightly to her king. She is spiritually strong. She is unwavering. She will not be tossed about and will not stop charging the open door. And she is and always will be victorious because she will keep the word and not deny the faith. I want to be that church. 